Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the Changeling the Dreaming 20th Anniversary Edition rules by White Wolf Publishing. This actual play is performed by adults and contains adult themes. We welcome you to our freeholds and our dreamlands, but take caution as there are things that go bump in the night. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc., which may bear resemblance to entities living or from places from far beyond dreams, is strictly coincidental. And now, on with the show. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I am not your keeper, your handler, or your storyteller this evening, because we are back with our Changeling, the Dreaming 20th Anniversary Edition. And Storyteller James is here, and he will step in and assist our magical creations. Thank you, Mike, and welcome back to episode two of the Changeling the Dreaming 20th Anniversary Edition campaign, Whispers of the Lost. Episode two is called Breaking It In. Let's see who will be breaking it in with us this week, shall we? To my proverbial right. I'm Bunny, my pronouns are she, her, and I play Edie Dresner. I'm a knocker who is losing her cool. It happens. You probably, you'll find it later. It's probably under the radiator. That's usually where I lose stuff. At the metaphorical end of the table. Hello there. My name is Mare, pronouns she, her, and I am playing E, Aaron, our Cluricon friend who's ready to rock. It's kind of a like a bagpipe punk rock, kind of a dropkick Murphy's thing, I think we decided. That's a that's a very good kind of rock. Creatively across the table from you. Hi, I'm Rena. My pronouns are they, them, and I am playing Kelly Wild, she they, and I'm going through some ch ch changes. Um, sometimes it helps to turn and face the strange. In a nearby pocket dimension. Yeah, hi, I'm Mike. I am playing Rowan Stewart. I'm both of our pronouns are he, him. And it seems we have a live one. I, I'm glad because if you died in the first episode, you mean that I'm a George R. R. Martin caliber creator and well, no. Welcome back, all of my lovelies, to episode two. When we last left our intrepid heroes, I do believe there was one Kelly Wilde who was currently standing in the middle of a studio looking, hmm, well, how do we say, um, put out, slightly disturbed, a little disheveled, if you will. And for Kelly, looking disheveled at all, well, that's just, well, that just won't do. Truth be told, though, for the three of you, she doesn't look disheveled. She just looks a little freaked out. But she seems to be panic preening right now. Cle cleaning lint that you cannot see off of the sleeve as she apparently seems to be trying to figure out what has happened with all of these ch ch changes that have come and gone across and seem to be here to stay. Um. So... As far as the room goes, beyond Kelly, Edie is still here, yes? Edie is still here. Edie has returned to the dress that they were attempting to repair the zipper on before Kelly went and made a life-changing discovery on the couch, and Edie was so rudely interrupted. I actually went to my swear corner when they got here. Rowan, you obviously see Kelly here trying to figure out what is going on with these massive changes you don't immediately see ed you heard a door close earlier and then after a few moments you hear down a short hallway you hear a door open and close again and ed you have we'll say released some steam into the room side note the room that you swear in you have had to replace the wallpaper six times wallpaper paint it doesn't matter it chips peels and begins to fall off the wall you're pretty sure it's not good for the structure of the building to keep bottling all of those swears up in one room, but what are you going to do? You don't want to lose the apartment. It's a nice apartment. I try to balance it by keeping motivational posters that keep needing to be replaced, like hang in there, kittens, on the walls to try to diffuse it, but it just 
It doesn't work. I have a dedicated poster budget every month. It's probably a good idea. Storyteller, are there no, are there normies here? Well, that's funny you should ask because the only the only normal here, the only normie here, is a gentleman stands up. He's wearing a yellow shirt. He turns around. He has earbuds in, and he notices there are now four people in the loft where he was going to begin shooting. Stops for a moment. Um, but uh, he takes his earbud out. What are you guys? What are you guys doing here? I'm just here to see a friend. Are they? Hmm. And he points Edie and Kelly. They're with me. Are they going to be in the photo? Because I mean, this one. And he begins to slowly circle around you, Rowan, like a camera wielding vulture. Now this one, I can make a career out of. Oh my god, I want to scale these cheekbones. And you, sweetheart, hmm, kind of reaches around and pulls the pulls the shock of hair back a little bit. I like this. This is nice. But maybe we just do something to control this a little bit. Anyway, and he turns back around to Rowan and gazes at him for a moment before finally, like, managing to break eye contact. I mean, you know, if you guys want to, you you can sit in. I. Kelly, are you ready, dear? Kelly has been sort of shocked out of uh, their stress reaction to things by the fact that Gentry's paying attention to someone else. Yeah. Gentry. He wasn't just paying attention to somebody else. He was actually fawning a little bit. Over here, Gentry. Focus. Focus. Hello. Star of the show. Of course, my dear. I would... (laughs) Trust me. If anything, that would be a side career. Although the two of you... And he kind of like traces your jawline and then like looks over at Rowan. Hmm. I'm watching him. Does he seem to notice the physical changes? Because... He doesn't seem to be responding to them at all. In fact, you've had to move your tail twice so that he doesn't step on it. Okay, this is weird. All right, uh, so um, friends of Edie's, lovely to meet you, I suppose. And just sort of picking hair and things off off of uh, the lapels of my blazer that I'm wearing at the moment. And just picking at it, not making eye contact with anybody. All right, this is this is this is nice. This is nice, but we have um, work to do. <laughs> As she is um, attempting to calm herself, you were uh, seeing Gentry begin to set up the cameras and such. Edie, the two of them are standing not still not too far away from the entryway. What are the three of you, as Edie, you no longer needed for the actual photo shoot part, as Gentry is setting into work? The flash that goes off occasionally is a little disorienting to the three of you, as you're not entirely used to it. Kelly feels like home. Edie, if an or if an outfit flashes while you're working on it like that, you usually put it in some sort of smoke hood and just let it explode, and then move on to something else that maybe didn't have that much whatever that was in it. Not every creation can be approaching perfection. She is white knuckling two energy drinks. One, just one in each hand while talking to Rowan and Aaron. (laughs) Just looking up at Rowan going, yeah, if I could bottle that, I wouldn't even be here right now. Damn. What are you bottling? She just gestures with an open palm at your face and goes, that. (laughs) Rowan looks genuinely confused. It's okay. He doesn't get it. But this happens more often than you'd imagine. Hi. Hi. I'm Erin. Wow. What an exciting day for y'all, huh? Yeah, I am. I'm a fashion designer. These are my outfits. Getting a little bit distracted from why she called Pepper to bring you here. She starts gesturing at the clothing racks in the photo shoot. We're doing we're doing a shoot for my newest line. It's going to be in some fall fashion shows, hopefully. And trailing off about her online store, she realizes, oh, right. But then that's when it fucking happened. So... 
Kelly just, you know, in the middle of getting ready. Like tail and all just like turned around and poof or? Yeah, we saw some cats, blue one, green one, you know, (laughs) the unusual. And then uh, she had a tail and the ears came in and they just, they're like that now. So can't do a goddamn thing about it. Called you. Well, hey, uh, we, we kind of had a feeling this was coming. We received a message. Uh, and yeah, I'm glad to hear from Pepper uh, where you are. And while this is happening, uh, <laughs> while this is happening, Erin has made her way over to the racks. She's taken her hands and just like, you know, tried to roughly wipe off the espresso beans and splashes of coffee and uh, then just starts fiddling with it, with all of the the shiny little bits and seeing like a collection together. And it's just like, ah, this is such a nice little thing. As you are pawing through the various outfits, you come across a bracelet. It's about, you can easily get your hand in it. It looks like it's made of old brass. It looks like a, an actually a fairly large ring. It's antique. You can tell that it's quite old, but you're not sure other than that. But it catches your eye immediately amongst everything else. There are other shinier things. There are other baubles in here, gemstones and rhinestones galore. But that's the one thing that your hand comes back up out of the box with that you're like, yeah, (laughs) you're going to stay with me now. The weight of it is almost reassuring. The camera flashes again. Kelly, you've never experienced this before as you're posing and attempting to hold your face in such a way or Gentry gently guides your form to make you look as, you know, bring perspective off one direction or make this color pop more. Or every time he flashes the camera, it started small at first, almost like a, like a hiccup that you know is about to happen. But you feel it bubbling up through you that every time the camera flashes, you get these little visions, little bursts of imagery. It is unpleasant, is definitely a good use of the word. Every time it happens, you involuntarily wince and your eyes close. And after the second or third time, Gentry, no, sweetheart, you need to open your eyes. Come on. You know that. That's 101, baby. All three of the other three of you hear him say that as he steps forward towards the set and kind of moves. You got to keep those eyes open. We want to see those, sweetheart. Those are your moneymakers. James, if I, I'd like to get a, um, maybe an intelligence kenning roll to see, sort of see what we have here. I would definitely like an intelligence kenning roll. Yes. Well, Aaron is um, is listening and taking it in, but is also staring at the large brass bracelet on her wrist. I have three successes. Excellent. The camera flash is definitely not something that she is shy to. And what she seems to be experiencing is those flinches seem like she's, if you had to guess, you say that she's seeing something or experiencing something. It almost looks like PTSD, but that's not. It's not that same sort of twitch. Uh, It seems almost like a knee-jerk reaction. Sure. There's a there's a full body twitch. I'm trying to identify like her kith. Her kith. Based 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 on seeing Kelly. Based on from what she looks like, she is definitely her kith is definitely Puka. She has her soul is entwined with the spirit of an animal, perhaps some sort of house cat. Going on the ears, the tail, the teeth. You're pretty sure her fingernails were probably that pointy already, so... And probably painted. Kelly, what you're seeing, the first camera flash that goes off, the first thing you see is some sort of a a park area. You're standing on a, a barely paved, cracked road, and you feel invigorated, but lost at the same time. The exhilaration of discovery combined with fear you see Kelly twitch 
the second camera, this one, you feel like you're completely submerged in water. Black, inky water. Thrashing. Clothes wrapping around you and becoming more of a net than coverage. And only for the length of a camera flash. And then you're back in the studio. That one takes your breath almost completely out of you. He takes another picture, although this one seems to be slower. He seems to be noticing that you're not having as easy of a time with this. You see some sort of spider. It's huge, leering. Or are you small? Maybe you're very, very small, but you're back. And the last camera flash before Gentry stops, there's a man standing in an olive brown suit. And he's standing in the ruins of some sort of stone structure. Maybe it was an abbey or a, an old castle or something. And he's holding a hat in front of him like he's twisting it. His hair is flowing around him like he's underwater. But you don't feel like you're underwater. And then you're back in the studio. And that's when you make me a willpower roll. Oh, okay. One success. All right, well, you keep what little you've eaten today right where it's at, as that swimming back up to consciousness for each one of those flashes is giving you, um, you don't want to say motion sickness, but the room does spin a little bit when you get back. The three of you, by this point, I'm sure, have stopped talking to each other and are have noticing. Mm -hmm. She seems to be having a bad time of it. Rowan, you were already paying attention, but Aaron and Edie, you by this point have noticed, and even Gentry stops taking photos. Sweetheart, are you okay? We can reschedule this. You know, I will always reschedule for you. I'm not feeling it today, Gentry. I must be not feeling well or something. I, d I don't know, but I'm, I'm just not feeling it. The vibes aren't right. The atmosphere isn't right. It's just, it's just not right. Kind of looks around the room. It is a little crowded in here today, but I don't think that's it. I understand, sweetheart. I can feel it. It's not today. I'll catch up with you in a couple of days and we'll try it, okay? I got this idea that I want to do what up on a roof. Something with morning light. I think it'll be gorgeous. Yes, the higher the better. Edie, sweetheart, I'm going to leave my equipment here because I just got everything unpacked and I do not want to put it all back in the bag. Absolutely. Gentry, don't even worry about it. All of your artistic flies will be here exactly where you left them so that you can do what you need to do soon. We'll reschedule for soon. He comes over and he boops you on the end of the nose. You are a sweetheart. And then he walks over to Kelly. Listen to me. And he lifts you up. I don't know what it is. And I don't care. When you're ready, I'll be ready. Okay. And when I'm ready... Edie will have figured out how to get me up on the roof so that we can take pictures. He grabs a bag. Looks like it's made of vinyl and hot pink. Slings it across him. All right. Steps onto the elevator, slams it shut, and pushes the button. Well, I'm going to go get something to eat. I'll be back later. And the elevator proceeds to head downstairs. The moment the elevator doors close, like, all of the keeping it together because I have a job to do kind of thing just sort of gives way. And I just sort of crouch down on the floor with my arms around my knees and the tail is twitching because I don't know how to make it stop. And I keep trying to stop it and then realizing it's not going to. And then this is insane. I have a tail. What is happening? Um, just you see big, wide, just amber eyes just staring at you very, very intently. And the ears are twitching a little bit just sitting in this corner. Edie's going to go to the mini fridge under her workstation and pull out some smoked salmon that she keeps in the fridge. I don't know why, but I feel like this might make you happy right now and just sort of slides it on a saucer in front of a crouching Kelly. You are equally of two minds with this, Kelly. There's part of you that's like, this woman did not just offer me fish on a dish on the floor. But the other part of you, and equally as loud, says, I like her. She just put fish on a dish and she put it on the floor for me. I'm doing that thing where I'm staring back 
still, but just slowly picking off pieces, kind of in a similar way to how I was picking lint and hair, invisible hair from my blazer, just picking off these tiny little even-sized pieces and slowly eating them and staring at people, not even realizing I'm doing it, just sort of automatic response. That's damn good. Okay, this is, she wasn't wrong. This is really good. The food helps a little. You don't remember enjoying a smoked salmon this much, ever, bagel or not. By the time you finish the small amount on the plate, you have begun to uncurl just a little. Rowan and E, you see that she has begun to unwind just a little. She's maybe down from 100% defense mechanism to 95 now. So, I mean, that's a plus. Okay. Aaron kneels down and she's like, Hey, how you doing? Are you feeling feeling a little better? Kind of, you know, how's enjoying the fish? I'm not five. No, but you seem like you... You seem like you've had a really hard day. Do you want to talk about it? I have a fucking tail. And... 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 Her arms are too long. And... And I've got blue tattoos everywhere. Yep. It's a lot. My god, Montresor. What is happening? And just... uh. Oh, and he's really attractive. Like, inhuman, right? Yes. It's not a superpower, E. It's just your face. We know. We see it. I sit down on the couch. But first, I ask Edie, do you mind if I sit? Oh, no, please. Um, I invite everybody here to make themselves comfortable in my space. As long as nobody damages any of the clothing. As she, like, pets her finished clothing inventory, almost like you might pet a beloved animal or pat a, a well-loved child's hair or something, just like a eerie pet down the sleeves of the clothing closest to her. If in technical terms, right, this is a clothing collection, right? Am I watching Edie get any particular joy from being immersed in her collection? Oh, overwhelming joy. Fantastic. I, as a Clericon, usually gather my glamour from fellow collectors. Ah, uh, yes. There's something about a horde that sings deep inside your Irish blood. In fact, standing there watching Edie pet and regroom the each dress and each article of clothing, straightening and primping, and knowing that Edie is proud of each one, made each one, and they're all part of her set. Yes, you may take a glamour for that, definitely. Thank you. That is definitely, in fact, Aaron watches that for probably longer than... Like goes up, sniffs a couple of jacket, fiddles with stuff. Oh yeah, she is, she is happy that Edie is happy in her collection. The four of you. The room is, of course, now normal free so conversation is a little more easily conducted certainly so I'll look at at Kelly as they're uh, curled up on the floor after salmon and um, say my my name is Rowan I'm here to help explain some things Kelly So, today's been a lot. Yeah, you could say that. Oh, I've lived it. It's hard. The great... How fortunate for you that you had another... Another changeling around. Another fae in the room when it happened. Another what? We'll get to that. Details. Part of what makes you who you are is different than many of the people you interact with on a regular basis. It's not about skill. 
it's not about your dreams in the way you probably interpret them at this point. What it's about is who you are at your core. You're what my relatives would call part of the fey folk. You're a waking up, to speak, at now. And that's why you have a, a face with ears and fangs and a tail. It's really a splendid thing once you get used to it. And the great part is, is like only, only those of us who exist within this same society see that part of you. Like your cameraman friend never saw a thing. Okay. That's a lot. So you're all Fay. Oh, we don't use quotations. Not one talking about that. Okay. Yes. I um Fay or sometimes called changelings, depending upon who you're speaking with. There are many different types, which we can certainly get into later. Um the here and now is that you have a very colorful and beautiful existence ahead of you. And it's one that is very rewarding. Uh huh. Sure. I feel like I, sh- I should be more skeptical of the whole thing, but I have a fucking tail, so I don't think I'm going to be going down that particular route. It's kind of hard to ex, ex- and just hyperventilates a little bit explain everything. Yes. And we all deal with the change a little differently. But there are many different types of fey, and then they have groups within themselves. So these are called kith. They're the hereditary portions of that essence. Aaron here is one particular, and Edie is another. I'm something entirely different. So, so what do I do? I smile. Like, genuinely, broadly smile. You learn how to have an entirely new set. Style of fun. You get to roll around in your passions. Probably like catnip. No offense. Slow blink. Charles Curl's ears perk up for a moment. Aaron cackles. You get to learn about a completely different subset of people, a, a land of dreams, one that you couldn't have possibly seen before. But now we'll get a chance to experience. I don't have to give up my normal life, do I? I mean, she still makes things for the real world. Or sorry, not I, I don't know what the real world is anymore. The human world. It's okay. It's, we're all a part of the same world. It's just like putting on a different set of glasses. You're going to be able to see different things. And other people won't see them, but you will. Um, and certainly, Edie's craftsman work will still be as splendid as it is. You'll be able to walk around in it. And maybe it will do different things for you. Not just make you look astonishing. That bracelet, I point, cutting in there because of what Rowan said. That bracelet pointing at Aaron's wrist. What bracelet? That one is the one that I use to cool myself in the summer. I I use the powers of winter and I make it all cool and I just use it as like a little personal air conditioner and it's the best. I mean, you can have it, you can have it, you can have it, but... Uh, Oh! My fashion can be more than pretty. And she just got very excited about a chance to be like, oh, Rowan understands there's utility in the beautiful things and had to had to chime in. Less use willpower and goes back to her crafting. You'll get a chance to meet your own kith, as we would call it, your own specific type changeling. We're all grouped in a sort of way. 
It's like different types of frogs and toads, right? They would all do kind of the same thing, but they're really different. And some can be, you know, they have all like different personalities, I guess. I mean, I'm not a frog or a toad, but I imagine that they would. And some of them are poisonous. Some are poisonous, right? Yeah. I'm not poisonous, but you know, like it's it's like I collect things. I like music. Do you like music? Wait, is there a radio in here? And she's kind of ping pongs around. It might be a fucking delight, but I could be poisonous if I want to be. She says <laughs> quietly to herself as she slides a Bluetooth speaker towards Aaron. She says it way too loud. Aaron whips out her phone and starts pulling up the playlist right now. And it's just kind of like, I just imagine she has tunes to find out your true self to and just plays. Kelly, there is something about the way the three of them are interacting with you. As scared as you are about having a tail and fangs and this sudden thing that has been dropped in your lap, all three of them are being so unabashedly themselves that it's it's almost giving you this feeling of comfort a little bit inside that none of them seem to be freaking out about who they are. And it's helping a little. Kind of stretch out a little bit instead of holding my knees into my chest so much. Look around at everyone. So you've... You've obviously known these things for a long time. You're pretty chill with stuff. Yeah, my mother helped. I came to it as a young boy. And I benefited from having someone in the house who could teach me what it meant to be. What the power of belief can do. And equally, the dangers of dis. Okay. Okay. Have I always been this? Oh, sure. There's all sorts of um, fae who lay dreaming. We can see them sometimes, if you look real hard. You'll see a an echo that might be draped over the body. Like a, like a bird, perhaps, sitting on top of a birdhouse. Long wings, long arms. Perhaps that, perhaps that kid that always wears flannel. Wrapped around his waist real tight. He just hasn't woke up yet. And that happens. Some people stay asleep. And that's okay. So I woke up. Okay. Okay. This is a lot. Slightly overwhelmed. Not gonna lie. Uh, right. I mean, I've had world-shattering revelations dropped on me before. Plenty of times, in fact, it just seems my life is a series of world-shattering le- revelations. But this this one kind of takes the cake. Yeah, as it should. It should. But the mist now is something that doesn't stand between you and the world. Those have cleared. You can see who and what are. And vice versa, we can see you. Your photographer friend. The mists protect him. So I can be with my human friends and like my roommate and they won't notice the tail and the ears and all of that. I won't freak them out because I don't want to suddenly disappear because I can't see them anymore. You'll be okay. 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 You'll be able to rest and interact with them as you normally would. Okay. They might see some idiosyncrasies change with you, you might begin to act a little different. And that's part of coming into who you are now, understanding it, and growing with it. Cool. I guess. <laughs> Definitely seem a lot calmer now, especially with the idea that my environment doesn't have to change too much. People aren't going to freak out like that That idea. Definitely a lot calmer, a lot more relaxed in the body language. Edie, your phone buzzes from your pocket. Wee, wee. Huh. Edie pulls out her phone again. Hmm. Oh, Pepper texted. That's nice. Is she okay? 
Uh, without, she'll read it out loud to everybody, but without actually getting feedback from Kelly on if they're okay or not, <laughs> we'll just text back to Pepper. Seems fine. Real good new puka we seem to have here. Smoked salmon calmed down real quick. Now getting a good verbal petting from Rowan seems to be good. <laughs> we'll not worry about how that context might come out because Kelly seems like a cat that's being like gently calmed by a new friend and verbal petting sounds right to her. The moment you hit send, there are immediately typing dots and all you get back is verbal petting question mark. He's like, I don't know, fuck it. <laughs> she will text back. I don't know. He's like fucking soothing her with her his words and shit. I don't. It's working great, like a charm. The people you sent uh, are like puka catnip personalities. I love it. It's great. Send more <laughs> if you need to. But Rowan seems like a charmer. Send. Thanks, Edie. She is going to be muttering all of that out loud while typing. So, hey, hey, Aaron, Rowan, Kelly, anything to add? Pepper wants to know if you're okay. Okay's a word. Yeah, they're fine. It'll be okay. Hey, speaking of, you can always, you were worried about having to give up your mortal life. I work at a coffee shop, so you can come and see us anytime there. It's actually a really great place for folks like us. You'll run into a lot of folks like us there. Edie sends another text to Pepper as a follow-up immediately going, okay is a word, I guess, in quotation marks with like a dictionary emoji and a thumbs up emoji, and then pockets her phone again. Very nice. Erin, you work at a coffee shop for people like us? Yeah, yeah, well... It's not, like, for people like us. It's run fo by folks like us. Yeah, it's called Cat's Cradle. It was called that before. Anyway, um, but, yeah, so I work there. I've worked there. That's where Pepper is. So. Oh, you work with Pepper. Okay, okay, okay. And then she goes back to shutting you all out again happily. So if you all, like, you know, if you like coffee, there's that. And, you know, I can... I, and Pepper makes amazing cookies if you like baked goods. Really good stuff. Um... But yeah, no, there's it, there's a lot that we can do. Like, I still like going to the shows and stuff. I still love music. It rocks. Yeah, you just kind of go about your life, but you get to see cooler things. And, you know, yes, Rowan explains it all really nice and stuff. Rowan does a great job with that. But you got to kind of just live it, you know? As Aaron is standing there saying this, something flies by the window, Kelly, and whatever it was was multi-hued and had more than two wings. It doesn't make any noise, but it was brilliantly colored and it kind of swoops by. Okay, more things. More things. Outside. You, did you bring more? Or is it just there? I didn't bring any more. It's just we were asked by the house that I'm a part of. Come and greet you. And to see if we could help you in any way. I appreciate that. I don't know how I'm supposed to just go back to my apartment and have ramen with my roommate and keep going for a bit. I mean, I would like to. I feel like I'm going to need some sense of normalcy at some point but I, at the moment I honestly don't know how I'm going to go back to life with all of this ears twitch I dig into a pocket and I hand you a card okay it has the name Rowan Stewart on it and then there's a number on the back um, when you flip the card over on the back you see a very light sort of uh, blue and green flannel pattern on the back but just for a second Okay, so I can, you have a coffee shop and you have a phone number and I know obviously where you live, pointing at Edie, so I can talk to people. It is nice not to, I, I can't imagine if this had happened this morning before I got in the Uber. <laughs> I have no interest in abandoning you here. We have 
things to teach you along the way to make you more comfortable with what's going to happen and to prepare you for future events. Mildly ominous there. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I mean, here's my phone number too. If you want that to be in the more normal thing too, just give me my number. Thank you. Do we have like meetings and things? Is, is that a thing like a get togethers and family reunions and potlucks and that sort of thing? In a, in a manner of speaking, sure. Oh yeah. No, no, Rowan, I got this one. Yeah. And you, they mail you a free toaster and everything. It's great. It's fucking delightful. You'll just have such a great time with it. There's a little card, a toaster, a welcome platter. Mm, eh. No, what? Too soon for sarcasm? How are we too soon for sarcasm? It's been at least a half an hour. I didn't say we were too soon for it. Oh, just so you're aware, Edie, the the Duchess is coming. So what? <laughs> and now you say that? Yeah, I just want, I wanted to get the formal business portion of this out of the way, um, and then just let you know. That we've got three or so days until the Duchess is here. So, Kelly, our um, group is broken into specific regions. These regions are, you know, kind of territories of sorts. Think of them like, well, think of them like duchies. Think of them like um, medieval kingdoms of a sort. Yeah? Some Game of Thrones stuff. Uh, yeah, well, um, I can't say I watched past season six. Honestly, you're better off for it. Anyway, like he, like he was saying, yeah. Yeah, so you're going to get a chance to meet um, at places specifically for us, like Cat's Cradle, which is what we would call Freehold. And it's where a little bit of our own sort of um, personal light exists at. Think of it like a lighthouse. You stay there for a little bit. You interact with some folks. And then when the time comes, you take off and go about your merry way. It's a great way to get recharged and talk with um, other, well, other faith. When can I do that? I shrug. Realistically, it's sort of up to you. Although it would be good to get you a little bit up to speed on some of the more particular points of how the society works before someone very um well socially powerful like duchess arrives okay duchess is coming again mildly ominous you'll teach me some things looking at everybody i hopefully won't trip over things too much although tripping over things never seemed to bother me all that much to be completely honest that probably explains a good bit now that i'm thinking of, okay i don't want to think about that too much little bit overload. Overload. Okay. Allie didn't bother you much because you land on your feet. Am I right? Yeah. Actually, yes. Mom just said I had really good reflexes. That's all. She was right. Aaron, roll me a perception alertness. That's two successes. As Rowan and Edie are talking to Kelly and Kelly is beginning to calm down, you find yourself tapping your foot to a beat that at this point it's it's a beat that's not coming out of the speakers on the other side you realize after just a second that you are tapping your feet and you're tapping your foot in fact to the beat of a car alarm down the street just like everyone does with a car alarm you crane your head and look out the window and you see a couple of blocks down there's on one of the sides of the street it looks like a group of people have gathered near this car or whatever vehicle it is, and they seem to be arguing or fighting or something is going on. But they seem to have bumped into the car and set off the car alarm. This is not what disturbs you. I mean, fights happen. What disturbs you is that over the crowd and standing on top of the car, is a very spindly, vaguely arachnid creature about the size of a Great Dane. It has, it is not in any way symmetrical and it is quite twitchy 
in and out like as it moves it twitches not in ways like joints twitch but almost like tv channel twitchiness it is definitely chimerical and as the crowd argues and starts to get more riled up it seems to almost be you can you swear you can see now that you're really um, obviously have locked eyes on the scene it's quite distant but it looks almost like it's puppeteering some of the people that are getting more violent with some of its many many twitchy long spindly limbs Aaron makes her way to the window and looks there, just kind of suddenly up and makes her way over, sees all this, pulls the window open, all but hangs out of it. Sir, uh, sir, Sir Rowan, we have a problem. I I turn to you a little bit. Um, there's probably a, a different sort of twinkle or gleam in my eye. I have a I have a smirk on my face and I said, Oh, are you remembering titles now? How wonderful. I stand up. Apologies for before, but um, this is not exactly something we want to have hanging around before the Duchess is on her way. Step near the window. You'd probably, Kelly, you'd probably, Kelly would probably see like in my face seeming, I'm, I'm taller than I am in real life. So um, the ghost, the ghost sort of overlay image of my fate um, seeming is probably a little strange visually to look at. I step over to the window. What is that? I couldn't tell you, sir, but it looks like it would be a good rumble. Both Aaron and Rowan and anyone else who looks out the window can make me an intelligence gray mare. Well, I didn't know you were going to get me a gift. Thank you. Kelly, you see that the two of them are standing over by the window and seem to be looking at something rather intently. And there seems to be a a subtle dynamic shift that just happened between Rowan and Aaron. I saunter over to the window. Saunter is the best way to describe it. Unintentional saunter. It's just sort of always there. Always has been. Mm -hmm. Walking in cursive. I also join at my window and I got three successes on that roll, you asked. Wonderful. And the rest of you success numbers, sorry. Oh, I got no successes on that. Um, I would like to challenge at least to see if I could later on. If I don't know what it is, I would like to immediately start looking for how to fight it. Like, I want to start looking for weak spots. I want to look like which legs coming off first. That's that's her that's her brain space. So so I, I have two. Aaron, you're going to study this with an intelligence melee roll for me. Uh, Rowan, you look out and with two successes and Edie with three, the two of you, Kelly, you can make me a intelligence gray mirror roll. It is going to be for you. It's going to be a difficulty eight. Yeah, that's probably not going to go well because it's just going to be my three from intelligence. That is okay. Nope. I have a question slash challenge. Yes. Would we not consider in the moment battle and fighting to be more wits than intelligence? I can see the argument. I I will concede to wits. Yay. Okay. Thank you. That's because my intelligence is garbage. It will be more of, you will get a more instinctual knowledge. Rowan and Edie, with two successes, uh, Rowan, obviously this is some sort of chimerical creature. It is obviously not good, and you are going to guess that it is probably um, an unintentional construct because of the way it's malformed and twisted. Something, someone made this on accident. Edie, the only thing that you get more than that is a name that's attached to it. And the moment you remember it, it kind of tumbles out of your mouth. And the word is... Nervosa. She'll just say to herself quietly. Rowan, you remember some from combat classes back when you were younger. 
Uh, Nervosa is an entity that comes from either one very strong psychically disturbed person or a group of similarly psychically disturbed people. They are usually based around one mental concept. This one seems to be perhaps anxiety or panic, and it seems to be controlling and whipping this crowd into a frenzy. And it looks like it's trying to draw in more and other people. These are mortals. These are not, these are not fair folk. Mm-hmm. And nervosas are known to influence the mortal folk with generally what their essence is. An anger nervosa will drive people around it mad with rage. Inexplicable rage. Well, we have a unique opportunity here to protect some people. Let's do it. I got four successes on my how to beat this up thing roll. It is mostly joints. So you're assuming that probably hitting it in said joints will be a fairly good way to disable it. But you're assuming that it's actually living, existing and thriving from the energy that it's pulling from the people which means that it most likely has some sort of netting or webbing that you're going to need to sever. So it has something that looks like a web sack? Perhaps. Okay. You have to get closer to see it. Brilliant. I turn to Kelly. We're going to go work on something. You can come along if you'd like. You don't have to do anything. I'll, I'll... Is it something to do with vaguely wave my hands? (laughs) Yes. I sort of gesture the same way Kelly gestured at me. In a manner of speaking. Then I'll come watch, I guess. I'm good at watching things. That would be the cat wave. Aaron leaps up and just yells, I'll take the stairs and just starts booking. I hold a breath. I don't sigh because that would be just completely out of etiquette. You wouldn't want to diminish E's enthusiasm. No, not at all. Not at all. We'll we'll talk about uh, channeling the energy the right way at a later date. Aaron, you run off and true to your name, sharp as a razor blade, tight as a tourniquet and dry as a funeral drum. Do you call forth your chimerical polearm? Yes. She comes down there, and as she's stepping out into the sun, if the others are starting to see it, what was a barista type that would have had on, like, the dark clothing, the baggier things, all seems to kind of shimmer away until it turns into, like, golden and brass like armor so it has like a chest plate and pauldrons and the beanie itself kind of turns into a uh, helm as well so she's ready to go as she emerges down there the pole arm appearing wonderful so yes Kelly you see her emerge onto the street dressed in a full combat regalia of armor and it is actually quite fetching it looks like it's tailored for Aaron it doesn't look like something they found in some old barrow somewhere Tom Bombadil's ass or whatever it actually looks like it fits and the weapon is sized to Aaron and they look like they know how to use it they don't look like an uncomfortable you know 12 year old learning to play hockey they look like they are ready to roll Rowan you see your squire standing there ready to go and just chomping at the proverbial bit to use the polearm. Oh, by the way, what's the polearm's name? Weapons have names. I think that as a polearm, it's going to look a lot like a glaive, big like Sailor Saturn energy happening here. And I think the name for it will be Slice. I love it. All right. And it is almost unwieldingly large on one end because it it is a miracle. So you don't have to worry about it 
making sense. In fact, that seems to be, Kelly, the essence of this is that the things that you see that that the mortals don't seem to see, they seem to invoke a sense of not whimsy, but of the fantastic, almost like they were woven of stuff of imagination and dreams. And the unfortunate thing is you look down the street at this thing that's standing on the roof of this car, eh, probably also woven from nightmares too. Aaron charges towards it. Rowan, how are you getting there? I think that, um, I assume Edie's place has stairs and I see it has an, no, it has an elevator. Yes, it has both. So I'll take the stairs. Are you moving at a quicker clip because, uh, Aaron is charging headlong into things and, or you no, like, I, I she's going to learn gonna, a lesson. And I, yes, I think it is very <laughs> okay. important for the squire to learn a lesson about why we don't charge headlong into things. And if that's the way it has to be told, then so be it. So the three of you, Kelly, I assume, saunters down the stairs. Edie <laughs> grabs some things to finish the piece that they're working on as they're walking, I assume. <laughs> it's, it's good perfectly good sewing time walking down the stairs. One of the pocket, the Ron Popeil pocket sewing machines that actually functions. Rowan, of course, um, take your I mean, you don't take your time, but you know, a few extra minutes to get down to the street. By the time you get to the street, you hear the clash and clang. Aaron, you are now standing on the hood of a an old Buick. It's a beat up old Buick. The people around you are, you, you're tuning them out because they're all jeering and yelling at you. They're not making a lot of sense. They have a look on their face. There's a look of intensity that it's not normal and you don't have time to really register what it is because this thing in front of you is hissing and snapping with crab-like appendages at you and asymmetrical clusters of eyes in every joint. So the closer the knees and such get to you, that you can see them blinking and leering. And it's making this high-pitched sound all the time, like someone having a complete breakdown. Fighting this thing is just horrific. Every time you slice at it, a bit of goo squirts out and spatters against the armor. But you're starting to get worried that you're not making any real damage. Make me a... um, Melee roll, strength melee. Or or unless you are making more of a dexterous attack since it's a pole arm, I will accept dex melee. I'm going to go with strength, I believe. Uh, because I think that is a lot of her force because a lot of it will be like jabbing, trying to like hook into and get like leverage out those legs. Lovely. All right. And the whole time... She's just making cheers like, you know, the little dog from Labyrinth. Yeah, Sir Didymus. Yeah, she's I, I'm not I'm bad with names, but that is essentially her just, oh, come on, you coxcomb. Absolutely. So Rowan, your squire is yelling and stabbing at this thing gleefully. There is n- no effort whatsoever that Aaron is making to hide the abject glee that they're enjoying while fighting whatever this is. The three of you notice that the people around this thing have stopped moving and are all now standing, although their faces still look very angry, their mouths are all hanging agape as it looks like whatever it's doing to them is on pause, if you will, while it's dealing with Aaron. (laughs) But it seems to be pretty effectively dealing with Aaron. Why don't each of you tell me what you would like to do as you approach? We won't go into rounds or anything. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I pull my trap card. (laughs) (laughs) And I use Unearthly Beauty like that. Excellent. So you were using Unearthly Beauty. Um, Explain to us as a she what Unearthly Beauty does for you. So... Yeah, so essentially what I can do is I when I show the um when I show my face seeming like and I when I when I tell people how how what side of the sort of proverbial coin I'm on and I project that kith uh, presence so to speak I can get people all sorts of caught up 
and basically what what rowan does is he becomes even more beautiful and captivating and uh, than he would normally be so she had that power to sort of get people's attention in that way um, and that's what i'm going to be doing with it to explain what kelly sees from the from the eyes of someone who has never seen something like this before as Rowan walks up, he doesn't go for a weapon. He, he just extends both hands out to his sides a little bit in a very casual, relaxed manner. I suppose you, you don't approach them in any threatening manner, Mike? Oh, uh, no, not at all. Okay. He, he simply smiles and talks to them. But the waves of pure charisma that are, are emanating from him right now, you're having a hard time looking at the combat with the giant crab spider thing on the car because Rowan is demanding almost every bit of attention in the group. Every single person, every single mortal turns and looks directly at him and and just mouths agape and every bit of anger drains out of their face and is replaced with this calm awe as they're staring at Rowan's radiance. Yeah, so the 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 power, quote unquote, is sovereign. And so what I'm doing is basically saying, hey, no, that's not okay. And you have to listen to me. And indeed they do. They, you know that you have the ears and presence of every person here. And, and what, what are you telling them? What are you going to use this presence for? What would you like to say to them? I say to the crowd, I don't know what the disagreement is over, but I'm certain that there's a way that we can all come together and talk about it peacefully and reasonably to get to a solution. Don't you think that would be a little better than fighting and harming one another? Our city deserves better than that. Aaron, it's like somebody hit this thing in the side with a jackhammer as its whole body shudders to the left. You are using it, well, you're using it to your advantage because it twists it up and reveals a very soft underbelly that's more flesh than chitin and because of the inexplicable jerk that it does Edie and Kelly you both see it respond to Rowan's comment physically as the crowd is talking to him you see it almost as violent uh, an action against it as Aaron's polearm Looks like they're doing about equal damage to it. Go on, Rowan. What are you saying? The, the one of the guys. Well, he he was. I think he was breaking in my car. Aaron. One of the strands between this crab thing and that person snaps, and it shudders. One of its legs disappears. Is it possible that perhaps you were mistaken? Does he point at someone specifically? He. he points gestures vaguely towards the crowd. Perhaps it's just a misunderstanding then. I look at the car. Is it like the vehicle damaged? No, the vehicle is other than the fact that there's um, someone standing on it right now. I sort of um, just lightly chuckle. Come down. Aaron, he pats your leg. Aaron, who was looking so excited, thrilled within the fight, watches as everything deflates <laughs> and in her armor, the, her shoulders start to lower, her head starts to hang, and then she just kind of gets down off of the off the car. Make me a glamour roll. Uh, do we roll all of the dots that roll are there? Roll as many dice as you have in your glamour pool right now. Gotcha. Difficulty seven. So I have to get a seven and up? Yep. Okay, so that's three successes. Okay. The disappointment when Aaron drops down off the car, their ears droop there <laughs> like a puppy. and Like they turn like a little more green, like there's like, yeah. The, the red in their hair doesn't sparkle as much and their eyes don't sparkle as much just for a moment and you don't want to say that they're seeming blinks for a second but it's still there it just doesn't feel like Aaron's presence is as big as it was for a moment just a moment and then 
you smile for a second, Aaron, and you figure there'll be another one. And I mean, it is, it can still be stabbed. It's not dead yet, but you know, maybe just not standing on the car. Fine. (laughs) But his words wound it as well. A big slice appears across one of the clusters of eyes. And you think you understand what he seems to be doing. It looks like it's going to topple over the side of the car. Kelly, are you going to do anything? I know that you're new, but you feel this, this interaction in your blood. It, 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 it feels like something inside of you is responding to this. Even a little. I'll get closer. So I'm carefully observing everything that Rowan and Aaron are doing. And I feel like getting up closer and like being actually there in the crowd, I can uh, see more and understand more and also what is this weird thing that they're fighting and and what is happening with that so instead of standing like on the sidewalk across the street where I was I'm moving in closer to everything getting into the crowd wonderful I'll uh, look to the rest of the crowd and and because I can see this sort of spindly appendage creature I'm going to move the crowd away to sort of stretch out that spindly creature in hopes that it will fall over. Okay. Um, You begin to move the crowd away as real quick, Kelly, if you had to give this creature, since you don't really know what it's called, you just kind of know what Edie called it. If you had to give it a nickname or a name, what would you call it? Call it the angry spider. Okay. Um, So you think to yourself, and even say a little bit out loud, looks like a big angry spider. There's a crackling sound as clusters of eyes disappear and the number of legs becomes symmetrical. You also see many of the strands snap between the people and it seems more furious now than conniving and, and anxious. Edie, you uh, looking at it, it doesn't look like a nervosa anymore. It looks like an angry chimera. Oh, well, you know, that do it then. Eh. I mean, it still looks like it wants to beat Aaron up, but now it's moving more like a large tarantula and less like some funky crab thing. Rowan, your effect on the people is now overwhelming because they're not arguing with anything else. There's nothing else in their brain trying to control them. They are now completely at your beck and call. Okay. Well, um, I don't, I wield the power very carefully. And so with charisma and empathy, what I'd like to do is just ask them to disperse. Oh yeah. Hey, yeah. Listen, I'm wow. Uh, listen, we're sorry. We, we caused you a problem. Uh, and they start walking away. The one guy whose car it is, is like, um, it's actually though, it's, this is my car. And he like gets in. Th- thank you. <laughs> and he like, he closes the door and kind of s- the, starts the car and drives away. The chimerical spider, which now looks less like anything, the, the, all of the feel of the crab that it was before seems to have faded out of it. It climbs up the side of a building away from you. With a rapid, it looks more like an orb weaver spider now and across the roof and out. You've never seen a chimera change like that before from one type to another that to do it, to do that. And it is not as common as a lot of the other arts. We'll put it that way. It's not rare. It's just um, naming is not very common with Kelly standing um, now in the street watching this dog-sized orb weaver spider all of red and black climb up the side of a building up the fire escape and across on a roof. You suddenly feel, Kelly, intrinsically that you did that. There's not even a question. You made that happen. And it was with your words words have power you know that you've always known that the right word can change your life 
but you feel like that there there was this power in you just now that was more than that. A rich, flowing arcana that left a, a honeyed feeling on the end of your tongue that maybe wasn't bad, maybe wasn't terrible. Maybe this world life has an upside. I think I made a spider. Congratulations. Wow. And with that little wow, I think it is a perfect time tonight to roll credits on episode two. Tonight's episode was, of course, breaking it in. I want to thank my cast, my crew with a K, and I hope to see all of you next week with episode three. Episode three, bow before me. And although bow is spelled B-O-U-G-H. What could that possibly mean? I want to thank our all of you listeners. I would like to thank our Patreon supporters again. Without you, all of this would be nowhere nearly as easy or as luxurious as it is. And I would like to thank you all of your listening ears. Good night, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>